Hello everyone, welcome to The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. Today we're on idea number 23 out of 24. There's only gonna be one more after this. And today's idea is criticality and complexity. Once again, we squeeze two words together. A little bit different than our previous ideas. For one thing, you may not even have heard the word criticality in this context. Some of you, of course, will have. But also the idea of complex systems, which is basically going to be the theme of today's video, um, is a little bit different than what we've talked about before for the following reason. You know, in a couple of the last videos, we've been working our way up saying that we started, uh, or at least by the middle of the series, we were down into the microscopic world, understanding quantum field theory and atoms and all the way up to matter. But then when these little tiny pieces come together to make bigger pieces, you can see various bits of collective behavior, which we talked about in the emergence video, or you can make the whole universe, which we talked about in cosmology. But there's another possibility, which is that the different pieces come together in a complicated way. And that's when we get what we call a complex system. So it's a very natural thing to talk about. The reason why it's a little bit different than the other topics is because unlike everything else we've talked about, even though there's research going on in every single idea that we've talked about, they are what Thomas Kuhn would have called paradigmatic science. So Kuhn in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, distinguished between paradigmatic science where you have some paradigms, you have some special favorite ways of thinking, problems to work on, uh, examples to guide your thought, and therefore you know what questions to ask and where to go next. In a very real sense, complexity, complex system studies, is pre-paradigmatic, okay? You could argue about that. But it's still a field very much in development. It's newer than the other ideas that we were talking about. The idea of things being complicated is very old, but the idea of complexity as a phenomenon worthy of study in its own right, regardless of what the specific implementation of it is, is still a little new. So people are still trying to figure out what are the right questions to ask, what are the right examples to look at. Uh, so rather than sort of giving you the central ideas, it's not clear where the central ideas are here, where it's going to be more like we're wandering through the foothills of a mountain range that we're not going to get to glimpse entirely. There's an enormous amount of work being done in complex systems, and we're just going to hint at it, give you some of the sort of tools that people use so you're not surprised when you hear other people talk about it. Um, so one big question, why is it, why is it not yet uh, paradigmatic science? Well, we don't even know what we mean when we say complexity, okay? We don't even have the definition. And of course, there's probably not a definition. Things can be complex in different ways. So we ask the question, uh, when you say complex systems, the complexity of what is something you can ask? And I don't mean uh, of which system you're looking at. I mean, what kind of thing <laughs> are you looking at? So for example, uh, Mindscape podcast listeners, uh, might uh, have heard me talk with Scott Aronson recently. And Scott is a computational, the a theoretical computer scientist who works in computational complexity theory. So there, what they're doing is they're looking at the complexity of problems or questions, okay? That's one thing that could be complex. Prob problems or questions. So it turns out that you know, multiplying two numbers together is much simpler than taking a big number and factoring it into its prime factors. So given a question, how many steps does it take to answer that question is a measure of complexity of a problem. There's another set of measures of complexity for processes or algorithms. So this is rather than being given a question and you're asking it, you're saying, well, I. I have some input and some things happen to it and then there's some output. And so is the thing that you're doing complex or is it simple? Is that process over time complex or simple? That's a question you can ask. So we're going to talk about, uh, we're not gonna talk about either one of those things today. We're gonna to talk about the complexity of things, <laughs> broadly construed, okay, objects, organisms, um, the internet, biological uh, networks, right? The biosphere, um, all sorts of networks and complex things made out of little things, big and small, okay? We wanna say, what is, what is the definition of a system, a thing being complex? And then what are the properties that it has? And then how does it get that way, right? Those are the kinds of things we wanna ask. So 
even then, even when we say, okay, we're just talking about the complexity of objects, of things, right? Um, and we're counting things like the internet or the biosphere as an object in this. We still don't have a definition of complexity that everyone agrees on. Again, I keep saying that, but what I mean is there's more than one sense of the word complexity that is interesting to talk about. So let me uh, just sort of highlight this by talking about one of the most famous measures, which is the Kolmogorov complexity. And this also gives me a chance to uh, apologize to Professor Kolmogorov, who's name I misspelled and mispronounced in the probability video. Kolmogorov complexity uh, is a way of, there's different ways of thinking about it, so we're going to be very casual here. Um, think of a string of numbers, okay? And ask yourself, is the string of numbers simple or complex? And the way that this kind of thing happens is you sort of look at systems, examples, and you say, hmm, do I think it's simple or do I think it's complex? And then you sort of sit back and think, well, why did I think that? What was the actual reason that I would give for thinking that? So let's consider the string uh, five, 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 and it goes on for a million digits. It's always the number five. That's pretty simple, right? Like it's just the same number over and over and over again. Uh, and so you might say, well, okay, that's simple because it's just the same number over and over again. But then what about the string one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, dot, dot, dot. And when you get up to nine, zero, you go one, two, three, and just repeat forever, okay? That's not the same number over and over again, but you say, aha, but it's still simple. It's not very complex because it's just a repeating pattern. So maybe what I mean by simplicity, if I contrast simplicity with complexity, maybe what I mean is just that simple things repeat themselves over and over. Okay, so Komogorov comes along and says, well, okay, what about this series? One, two, two, three, 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 four, 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 dot, dot, dot. So you just repeat the number the number of times it is, but then when you get to zero, you repeat it 10 times, then you have 11 ones and 12 twos, you just increase the length of those strings every time, okay? Well, there's no repetition there, right? That, that series does not repeat itself, but but still, it's pretty simple, right? Like, I just describe it in a couple words. And that's the key, right? I can describe it in a couple words. I give you a short example, and then you instantly, in your mind, know how to figure out the rest of it, right? So Kolmogorov's insight was to say, okay, um, maybe the I can, I can talk about the simplicity or complexity of a string of numbers by asking, how hard is it to describe what the string of numbers is? So if I have just sort of a, a, you know, a random string, seven, six, zero, six, three, one, zero, nine, eight, dot, 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 okay? What, if there's no structure there, right? There's no way to tell you what that thing is. You have no idea what the next number is going to be. So you say to yourself, okay, these look to me to be simple, and this one maybe is complex. Now, a series of truly random numbers, you can see already, I want to argue, you know, is, is this complex or not? Uh, it's random. There's not, it's not like useful kinds of complexity, right? It's just hard to describe without just giving you the whole number. So you instantly see, well, there are different notions of the word complexity. The Kolmogorov complexity captures the notion of how hard is it to describe? That's a version of complexity. So the Kolmogorov complexity is literally the length of, oops, of the shortest algorithm. And you need to like fix a programming language or something like that, that outputs the number. The number, okay, so given a number, you say to yourself, well, look, the number five, I can write a very short computer program that just repeats the, the number five over and over again, even if it's a million digits long. I just do a, a loop, and I don't know what your favorite programming language is, but I do a loop a, a million times that prints out the number five. Um, likewise, for these repeating sequences or for these sequences that have some pattern built into them, but for a sequence that is just random numbers, the shortest program that would print it out just says print and then the number. And so if the number is a million digits long, or a billion or a trillion digits long, okay, that program will be much longer than the little tiny pattern program. So Kolmogorov complexity captures the idea that there is a pattern hidden within the number that you can reduce to a tiny little algorithm. Once you get to big numbers, most numbers will have the feature that the shortest algorithm that will print them out is roughly speaking print and then the number. Okay, most numbers are complex in that sense. Uh, but not all of them, like consider this number, 
3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 9, you know, and so on. 2, 6, 5, dot, dot, dot. Well, you know what that number is. It's pi. It's the digits of pi in decimal expansion. So if you know a little bit about pi, you know there are series uh, that you can write down, infinite series, that will approximate pi to any number of digits. And it's very easy in a small number of lines of computer code to write a program that will output the digits of pi, okay? So even though there's no structure in here in the sense of a simple repeating pattern or a simple rule that gives you these numbers, the Kolmogorov of complexity of pi is very, very small uh, because there is a simple algorithm that outputs it. And that reminds you that it's hard to tell when you look at a number whether its Kolmogorov of complexity is big or small. So here's another number that I, I have written down here. Uh, 8, 2, 1, 4, 8, 0, 8, 6, 5, 1, dot, dot, dot. And you look at that and you say, well, no, there's a bunch of 8s there, but that's not statistically unlikely, really, that there's three of the same number uh, in, that, in that sequence. I don't know what that number is. It looks random to me. Turns out these are the digits of pi starting from the 100th digit, okay? So it's actually very easy to write down a short computer program that prints this out, even if I had a million digits like this. So, but you wouldn't know if I just gave you that unless you're one of the people who memorize all the digits of pi, right? Or if I did it for a slightly different number, if I did pi plus the square root of two, the 100th digit of that, again, I could print that out in a very short computer program, but you would never recognize it as complex. So Kolmogorov complexity is very interesting. It captures something interesting, that there are some systems, whether it's strings of numbers or whatever, that have simplicity underlying them, whereas others are just sort of, you need to specify everything that's going on. But that's not the only measure of complexity, and in fact, it's not going to be the most useful one for us here. It is, it is a useful measure, but it's not gonna be the one that we're gonna care about here. I just wanted to sort of put it on the table there to highlight some of the issues, and because many of you probably thought of or, or know about the Kolmogorov complexity already. Okay, so for us, we're gonna look at systems in a very broad sense. Uh, when are they complex and when are they not? And one feature, in fact, the feature that we'll be talking about, again, you know, there's, once you get into the processes and how things do things over time and uh, process information, things become infinitely more complicated. So let's just look at objects at a moment in time. Um, one of the things that makes them complex has to do with how they manifest themselves in terms of spatial sizes, okay? So, a small, like something that is simple, if you have one big thing, there you go, a circle, circular, circle-esque, right? If that's your whole thing, that's pretty simple, I think, right? You just have drawn a circle, it's a certain size. And it's not just because there's one thing. If you draw many circles, but they're all the same size and they're in some pattern, well then, even though my circle drawing is not perfect, that's also pretty simple, right? There's nothing you can once again, in, that, in the Kolmogorov sense, you can sort of see how to build that up. Whereas if you have a bunch of circles, but of very different sizes in different places doing different things, then you're tempted to say, well, okay, that to me looks complex. You know, it's hard for human beings to uh, actually generate random numbers or random things. So I think that I have like three favorite circle sizes in my diagram, but you know what I mean, right? Here, maybe I can make it look a little bit more uh, realistic by drawing, making two medium sized ones there. Um, a variety of different sizes, that begins to resemble what you and I would intuitively think of as complex. And remember the game we play here is, we look at something, you know, we have this idea already of complexity informally. And this is sort of what pre-paradigmatic science does. It says like, how can we formalize that? How can we capture the essence of it in a way that we can make rigorous and quantitative and then do science to it? So the definition is not given to us. That's not the starting point. The starting point is our intuition. We try to make it formal and rigorous. So here is an idea, um, structure, at multiple, many scales. So something is going on at small scales, something's going on at intermediate scales, something going on at large scales. This seems to be, and this, I'm not gonna undo this, this is what I'm saying. One of the central ideas of complexity is that there are things going on at multiple scales. It's not just the same damn thing over and over again at some particular scale, okay? 
And that's interesting because, you know, you might think, well, that's not surprising. The universe is full of things at many different sizes and scales. And that's true. But the universe is complex. That's not a, that's not a contradiction or, you know, it's not uh, evidence against it. The interesting thing is that many systems that you might think of as complex nevertheless have a single characteristic size, right? So um, atoms have a single characteristic size, the Bohr radius. Not all atoms are exactly the same size. There's, di there's absolutely a difference, but it's a small multiple times the Bohr radius, right? Um, there's various things that you can do. You know, neutron stars have a characteristic size. They're all basically the same size. If they were bigger, they, they were heavier, they would collapse into black holes. If they were lighter, they wouldn't make neutron stars in the first place. There's sort of a window they can be in. But even more than that, uh, even things that you really think of as complex, like an atom or a neutron star, you might think of as simple. But think of like biological organisms, okay? So the example I looked up on Wikipedia was um, the mass of an adult male African bush ele elephant. <laughs> African bush elephant. And it, you know, there's different kinds of African element elephants and the men and women are very different. Uh, but here are the, the male African bush elephants. You can look up, you know, what the mass is and the mass of a typical African bush element is about 5,900 kilograms. There you go. You can look it up on the internet. Um, I could be wrong about this number, but that's what I remember looking up. Um, so what does that mean when you read that in Wikipedia? Does it mean that every single adult male African bush elephant is exactly 5,900 kilograms? No, you know that's not true. It's a typical thing. It's sort of an average, but it's not just an average. Uh, saying that the typical mass is this, knowing what you know about elephants, if you found an adult male African bush elephant that was one kilogram or that was 500 million kilograms, you'd be really, really surprised. <laughs> so it's not just that there is an average size, that it's that most things are pretty close to the average size, relatively speaking, right? You don't find elephants that are this big. That's just not something that you find uh, very often anyway. So if you were to plot, and this is what we do, this is your, the complex systems research is sneaking up on you here. If you plot, you know, X, which is the mass of an elephant versus the number of elephants of mass X, I'm using X because we'll use it later for other things, uh, it looks kind of like this, right? There is a peak at some value and it's distributed in a sort of bell curve like shape. And you'll forgive me for the, my inability to draw perfect Gaussian bell curves, but that's basically roughly what you mean. There's a central value, uh, x0, zero, here 5900 zero, zero kilograms, and there is some dispersion or standard deviation around there, but that's basically what you see. And so that's why, if that's the distribution, you'd be very, very surprised to see an adult male African bush elephant, which is one kilogram or 500 million kilograms. Those are very small numbers here on the plot. In fact, they're zero for all intents and purposes, given the finite number of elephants in the world. Okay. So this kind of bell curve is extremely frequent, extremely common in nature. It's not everywhere, you know, just because things have distributions does not mean they're bell curves and that, that's important. And there's other curves other than this one that kind of look bell curve-ish and there's all sorts of details, but we're gonna ignore most of those details for the moment. There are a set of things in the world that look as if they're distributed according to this kind of distribution. So this kind of bell curve distribution is called a Gaussian, if you're a physicist, uh, if you're a St statistician or a mathematician, this kind of distribution is so common that they just call it the normal distribution. I think that's why they call it the normal distribution. There's all sorts of other reasons why that might be the word, but it's called the normal distribution. And it looks like in math terms that the number of X, forgetting about the normalization, because you can just normalize it by making it a frequency or you know, making it a probability density, you can divide by the total number of elephants, okay? Uh, then it is equal, well, let's just say proportional to e to the minus x minus x naught squared over two sigma, where x naught is the mean. There we've drawn it right up there. And sigma is the standard deviation. It's the width of the bell curve. And it's this number right here. So if sigma is big, then let me make sure that if you're not familiar with my handwriting, you know this is a sigma. Oops. Come on. Sigma. Still not a very good sigma. Sorry about this. It's 
been a long day already. Um, so if sigma is big, then it's very spread out, and then the peak will go down if we normalize it in some way. But basically, you just need these two numbers to tell me what kind of Gaussian or normal distribution you have. Where is it centered, and how fat is it, or how thin is it, how narrow it is. And like I said, this appears over and over again uh, in nature. There's various quantities that obey this particular kind of relationship. Um, it doesn't have to be elephants, right? The height of, so you need to be careful, right? If I say the height of, let's say, adult American human beings, uh, well, then it might be a little bit bimodal because there's women and there are men and they are slightly different heights. Um, if you don't say adult, then you have a tail because there are children in the world, right, who tend to be shorter, etc. So you have to be careful. But nevertheless, there are many examples where there is some sort of bell curve distribution. And why? Why is it that? distribution. Uh, so number one, why is it sort of localized at some one particular mean value with a small, relatively small deviation around it? And number two, why is it that shape at all? And you might say, well, okay, maybe the shape is the bell curve just because it's simple, right? So it is simple, but a step distribution is equally simple. And we're using the word simple here without defining it. What I mean here by simple is that it only takes these two numbers to define it, right? The mean and the standard deviation, then I know exactly what kind of bell curve I have. So let me consider a step distribution. I'm not going to go into great detail here, but what if n of x was just 0, and then for some set of values it was flat, and then it was 0 after that, right? Then once again, I could call the middle x naught, and I could call the width here sigma, and those two numbers would completely um, specify my distribution. If I, if I normalize it, when I say normalize it, what I mean is the area under the curve is fixed to be 1 or some, some other number, but some known number. So otherwise, I, don't, I would have to tell you the height of the distribution as well. But that's also true both for the bell curve and for the step function. So for the step distribution, for this flat thing, it's just as simple. And yet we don't find many distributions in nature that actually look like that, right? It's relatively rare. Why is that? And so there's a reason. As it turns out, I wouldn't be asking this if there weren't a reason. There's a reason called, well, let's say there are reasons. And one of the reasons is called the central limit theorem. And this is not exactly uh, crucial to complexity science, but it's sufficiently cool that I should tell it to you anyway. Uh, many of you know the central limit theorem already. So I'm not going to either prove it or even state it in generality, but I'm going to give you the essence of it. So the central limit theorem says, you know, imagine you start with some, some random variable, some random number that has, and just for simplicity, let's say it has a distribution, n of x, that is a step function, and it is also, it's not a step function, a step distribution that is centered around zero. Let's make my life easy, okay, by centering it around zero. And what I want to do is take many samples. So take, let's say, n equals 100 samples from that distribution, which means that I will randomly choose a number with the probability given by this particular function. You saw the probability video. You know what that means, OK? And then add them together. So add up my 100 random numbers sampled from this distribution, OK? And then divide, just to make my life easy, this is an optional step, but divide by the square root of n, which equals 10 in this case, OK? And then say, OK, I get a number, right? And so I'm going to do that process, get 100 numbers, add them together, divide by 10. Get another 100 numbers, and we do it again and again. Another 100 numbers, add them together, divide by 10. Another 100 numbers. And so I will generate a different distribution, which is not the distribution I start with, but the distribution of these processes that all include getting 100 random numbers. Okay, So I'll get a different distribution. What does that look like? Well, the, the new distribution will always be a normal distribution. And why is that? Even though I start with a uh, step distribution, the point is I didn't even need to start with a step distribution. Almost any, there's some, of course, mathematical restrictions, but if I, if I had something that was like, you know, this, did the same thing, I would still get a normal distribution at the end of the day. Um, and so yeah, here's a normal distribution. Let me plot it. There we go. Slightly better looking bell curve than I had last time. Why is that? Well, look, if I'm picking random numbers from this distribution, right? There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. The, the vertical, there's no height difference there. 
the, the height doesn't make any difference is what I mean. And I add them all together, there'll be some positive numbers, some negative numbers. Typically, you will get a number close to zero, right? You know, there'll be cancellations between the pluses and the minuses. And so you're going to get a large number of answers that are close to zero, relatively speaking. But sometimes, rarely, all of your random numbers that you choose will just happen to have sort of bunched up over here near the negative side, okay? And then you will get, just by chance, a number over here, right, out on the tail, far away from the central point. It's rare, but it's possible. So, this, and that's the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem says start with a random variable with almost any distribution, uh, construct a new distribution by adding up many examples and then normalizing, and you will converge to a normal Gaussian bell curve shaped distribution. So the idea is maybe something like this is behind why this is true for elephants, right? In other words, maybe the height of an elephant is, is set by the action of a whole bunch of random things just being added together, right? Uh, genetic features, dietary features, uh, accidents the elephant got into when it was young, and so forth, uh, evo, devo, sort of genetic kind of uh, issues in biology. Who knows what the random factors are? But the point is it's very easy to imagine mechanisms that will naturally give you a normal distribution. And this is part of the game that we're going to start playing here in complex systems. We're going to study the features of a system um, in terms of like the number of times you get this or the number of times you get that. And then we're going to ask, okay, given that distribution that we get, what is the mechanism that could lead to that? And for Gaussians, for normal distributions, it's it's hard to do that because the mechanism is so generic, right? Like almost any additive complex process like that with random numbers thrown in is going to give you a normal distribution. That's the beauty and power of the central limit theorem. And one thing that we notice is that there is a typical scale. Remember we said that complex systems have structure at many scales. The size of elephants doesn't have structure at many scales. Most elephants are around 5,900 kilograms, okay? So if that's true and it's so robust and it's so easy to get, how in the world do we get structure at all scales? How in the world do we get complex systems in nature? So this is where the word criticality comes in. I've gone, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes already without even telling what criticality is. Um, criticality actually is a word that I think originated in the study of phase transitions. Um, but for our purposes today, and I'll tell you why that is true, but for our purposes today, it is it corresponds to power law distributions. So the idea of criticality is um, more narrow. Criticality implies power law distributions usually, but power law distributions do not uh, imply criticality. So uh, I'll explain exactly what I mean by criticality in a second, but first I will tell you that even without telling you what it is, it leads to something called power law distributions. What does that mean? That means that the number of things as a function of, I shouldn't write it that way, should I? Uh, the number of things as a function of their size, so n sub things, whatever those things may be, elephants or whatever, uh, as a function of their size is going to be equal to some constant, so proportional in other words, times the size to some power. That's what power law means. And typically as the size gets bigger, things get more rare. So we'll make it minus some power alpha. Okay, and that's a power law. And so size is the independent variable. We say like four different sizes, what are the number of things that we're going to get? So you raise it to the power minus alpha. And you might ask, what is alpha? Well, for different things, for different things that we might look at, alpha will be a different number, okay? So one thing that if you're playing this game, if you, you ask number one, are my things that I care about distributed according to a power law? And if so, what is the slope of the power law? So this is called the slope. Now, why in the world is it called the slope? It's not the slope. <laughs> this is, you know, I know what math looks like. If I actually plot something like this, you know, like if I have n is proportional to uh, x to the minus 1, for example, and here is x, then it goes like this. It's, it's a curve. It's not slope at all. Uh, so the point is I take a logarithm of both sides. So I'm going to make a log log plot. I probably have already done this before uh, in the Biggest Ideas videos. And so when I take the log of n, well, that's the log of k times s to the minus alpha, if s is the, right, so s is the size here, right? 
And there's a rule of logarithms that maybe you don't know, but I'm telling it to you. Uh, two rules. One is the logarithm of a product is the sum of the logarithms. That's one of the nice things about it. The other is the log of something to a power is that power times the log of the something. So this means that log n equals log k minus alpha log s, okay? So this curve representing a power law becomes on a log log plot, here's log n, it's just proportional to log s, and minus alpha is the slope. There you go, that's why it's called the slope. So if you plot log n, versus log s, and this, we're going to be making plots like this over and over and over again, uh, it will look like exactly a straight line with slope minus alpha, okay? So power laws correspond to straight lines on log log plots. That is a crucial feature. So we'll, just make, we'll be making log log plots over and over and over again, okay? Good. So what I wanted to say was the word criticality implies, a, you know, when you're at a critical point, then you have a power law distribution of things going on, and here's the math behind what that means. What it implies is that there is a straight line in a log-log distribution, okay? Now let me tell you why we call this criticality. Uh, criticality comes from phase transitions, which is just the physics phenomenon of, you know, going from one phase like water, going from liquid water to ice or liquid water gas, or vice versa, in any of the different directions, right? So a material or a kind of stuff is in a phase if it has a certain relationship between its different properties. Like if you have liquid water uh, or a gas, like oxygen at some temperature or something like that, there's a relationship between the density, the pressure, the temperature, things like that, a relationship called the equation of state. And if you change phases, then that relationship changes. So the relationship between density and pressure is different for ice than it is for liquid water, okay? And the phase transition, I mean, it's sort of tangibly obvious to you because ice is solid and water is liquid, but that is actually a consequence of the fact that it's in a different phase. So phase transitions, as it turns out, have this power law-like behavior for what? Well, let me tell you what. Uh, let me look particularly at the classic example, which is the Ising model. And um, I would like to use an example like, you know, ice or something like that, but the Ising model is something we understand much better as physicists. So you may, you may or may not have ever heard of it, but for condensed matter physicists, the Ising model is the ultimate spherical cow, right? So for cosmologists, the universe is the spherical cow. For particle physicists, the simple harmonic oscillator. Or for quantum mechanics, the harmonic oscillator is the spherical cow. For condensed matter physicists, for people who work with materials, the Ising model is the ultimate spherical cow. And what the Ising model is, is um, a set of coupled, so interacting, magnetic spins, or little dipole magnets if you want. So you imagine some sort of lattice uh, of sites, little checkerboard pattern here. And there are spins that are either up or down, okay? Up, up, down, down, up, down. And the point is that there is an energy. These spins are talking to each other, right? And they want to be aligned, right? It's lowest energy when all the spins are lined up, when they're pointing in the same direction. It costs energy to make them be anti-aligned. And there's not, they're not in between. They're either up or down. That's the Ising model, okay? They're, you're not allowing them to go up and down or in between, they're either up or they're down. So what you can do is you can calculate the energy for any given configuration. That's kind of what you do. And there's different games you can play. So you can put, if you really imagine that these are magnetic spins. So the reason why I said magnetic is because real magnetic spins do have that property. They do want to line up. I can also put the whole thing in a magnetic field and then most of them want to line up in along the magnetic field. I could also put the whole thing in a heat bath. So I have a bunch of particles, a bunch of atoms bumping into each other, and then they want to knock them out of alignment, right? These sort of random buffeting forces will act on them. So this very simple system is actually kind of rich in uh, phenomenological possibilities. You can study it. You can study, this is the two-dimensional Ising model, right? It's sort of a lattice on a plane. Well, I can write interacting spins on a line, the one-dimensional Ising model. I can make them in three dimensions in filling space or whatever I want. So the Ising model is, is actually, you can see why it's the spherical cow of condensed matter physics. So at low energy, 
all the spins line up. So for, don't put it in a background magnetic field. So forget about the magnetic field filling all of space here. Just let the spins themselves interact. They will either want to be all up or all down. Okay, so this is an example of what? Spontaneous symmetry breaking, right? Remember when we did gauge theories and we talked about symmetries that could be spontaneously broken. There's a symmetry of the underlying theory that is broken by the vacuum state of the theory. So in this theory, if you just want the spins to be coupled, so this is low energy and this is high energy. So then either they want to all be up or all be down. So even though the theory doesn't care about up versus down, there's a symmetry. Uh, the vacuum state is either all up or all down, so there will be spontaneous symmetry breaking in the vacuum. Okay, and that's pretty easy. Um, so one way of thinking of that is to define uh, a domain. So a domain is a spatial collection of spins that are all pointing in the same direction. So if I'm looking correctly here, this looks like a domain of upward pointing spins. So is this, so is this. Okay, so these are domains. And so what we're saying here is that all the spins want to line at low energy. So in other words, there's one big domain. This is not what I drew here in the little picture, but what I'm saying in words is that the lowest energy state is just one big domain. Everything is either pointing up or pointing down. This picture has, you know, if I, I circled the upward spins, here are the downward spins. Here are the different domains, and there's sort of different sizes of different domains. Okay. But if you now, so we're not going to put an external magnetic field in, but let's put it at a different temperature. Let's heat it up. Let's put it in the oven, okay, and let it be buffeted by photons and air molecules and stuff like that, okay? So now you have high temperature, and if the temperature is very high, what does that mean? Just means high enough. Like there is a temperature sufficiently high that. Uh, sufficiently high that these interactions here between the spins are irrelevant. Like, okay, it's a little bit lower energy to be aligned than anti-aligned, but if the temperature is so high that they're just being buffeted back and forth, that's not going to matter, okay? So at very high temperature, there's no correlation between the spins. The spins are just doing, every single spin is just completely random. So it's an entire, entirely random. So what you expect is that at low energy, um, there's just one big domain. At high temperature, so low energy and, and zero temperature, at high temperature, the domains are going to be very, very small. Given that one single spin happens to be up, there's no reason for any of the spins next to it to be either up or down. They're being buffeted randomly. Okay, So some of them will randomly be up, but there's no reason to get a big domain of all plus uh, up spins or, or down spins for that matter. So if you were to plot here is just the low energy, the vacuum state. If you plot, oops, let me move this over here. This is the label for the plot. Um, if you were to plot the, the size of the domains versus the number of them, it would basically be at low energy, it's one big domain. So it's like that, okay? All the domains at low energy this over here. Um, I got the P. Uh, have the, basically the same size, and that size is the size of the whole system, whatever the box is. Okay, you imagine there's a finite size box that we're doing this in. Whereas, if we ask the same question at high temperature, plot size of domain versus the number of the domains, well, they're all very small. So you get something like this, okay, and then it falls off. So in both cases, there is sort of a characteristic favorite size. In the low energy case, the size is the size of the box. Uh, in the high temperature case, the size is zero or something very, very close to zero, some small number close to zero. But now, if that's true, so this is low energy at zero temperature. In fact, let, let's say it that way because I think it's sort of the contrast is better. This is zero temperature. There's no external buffeting. And here's high temperature. There's a difference. So guess what? 
somewhere in between, there is going to be a phase transition. There's going to be some temperature at which you cross over from the phase in which everything wants to be aligned to the phase in which everything wants to be random. So there is a critical temperature. And you see where the word critical is coming in here. So the critical temperature is that crossover point. And you might think that, well, maybe what happens is this peak starts from, you know, I guess from your point of view, uh, everything is at the biggest um, size if it's very low temperature. And then you raise the temperature and the peak just moves, right? And there's a middle uh, intermediate scale and there's a bigger scale. But that is not what happens. What happens, I can't draw this very well, um, but let's imagine this is our box and we have spins inside and what we're going to get are domains. So here are domains of upspins, more upspins, and then some of them will be very tiny. Some of them will be bigger. And what we'll get is sort of a chaotic, random, fractal mess with structure at all scales. So you might have expected that just the size smoothly changes, but there is always a favorite size, but that is not true. At the critical point, at what we call the critical point, the temperature, so this is T equals TC, there is some temperature for the Ising model, given the strength of this interaction that makes the spins want to couple to each other, there is some temperature at which you get behavior like this. And this is the size, and this is the number of uh, domains of that size, okay? Uh, so you get really small domains, you get bigger ones, you get bigger ones, and you get a power law. This turns out to be a power law. I think this depends, I can't tell you what the power law is because there are different quantities you can physically measure that give you information and the size of the domain is actually not the easiest thing to measure. The easiest thing to measure is the correlation length. Um, you get uh, uh, the difference between one spin, you have, you have two spins at some distance. What is the probability they'll be aligned versus anti-aligned? At low temperature, they're probably gonna be very aligned. At high temperature, it's completely random and there's some crossover point. And that crossover, that correlation length goes to infinity um, as, a, as some uh, power near the critical temperature. So the point is that even though, remember where we started here, we said that there's a central limit theorem that says there are certain kinds of random processes that give you bell curves, that give you normal distributions. Here's a different kind of physical process that gives you not a special scale, scale but power at all scales, okay? Interestingly, in the uh, um, Ising model, we can exactly solve the model. And the one-dimensional Ising model, I think Ising solved it. It's kind of easy. And there, in fact, there's no phase transition. There's no critical point. The two-dimensional one is harder, but it was solved, I think, by Onsager. Uh, and actually, the four-dimensional one has been solved by quantum field theory methods. And then uh, no one has solved the three-dimensional one exactly yet. So if you want homework problem, solve the three-dimensional Ising model exactly. That's, that's a good homework problem to think about. And we can go even further into this. You know, there's this, um, there's a relationship here. I'm just going to mention it without giving you any insight whatsoever because I want you to know the buzzwords also. There's a relationship between this and the renormalization group. Remember, we talked about renormalization and uh, uh, we had a whole video on renormalization. And we said that, well, you know, if you have a Lagrangian or Hamiltonian, let's say, that looks like, well, there's a phi dot squared term, and there is a derivative of phi over space, a gradient term, and there's a mass term squared, and maybe there's an interaction term, lambda phi to the fourth. And we did dimensional analysis, right? And we said that, well, m squared phi squared, that m gets big just by dimensional analysis, whereas these three terms have dimensionless coefficients. So if you look only at energy scales, remember the normalization group let you come up with an effective field theory that was only valid at energies below a certain cutoff. So if your cutoff is much smaller than this mass scale here, then there are no excitations in your theory that are energetic enough to make a whole particle with that mass. So everything becomes essentially massless, and it's, that's the critical point. There is a, there's a behavior where at very, very low energies, things behave like what we call conformal field theories that have no scale built into them, that are something is going on at every single scale because this mass parameter term becomes not important to what is going on. On, um, in the physics of it. So 
critical behavior is very closely related to conformal field theories. You'll remember the phrase conformal field theories when we talked about the ADS-CFT correspondence in the emergence video. So conformal field theories are a favorite playground for quantum field theorists. They're field theories without any scales in them, something happening at all scales. So that's what I want you to have in the back of your mind when you hear the word criticality. Critical behavior means something happening at every scale. And it is closely related, for obvious reasons, to complexity. Uh, why are they not exactly the same thing? Well, you know, critical behavior is well-defined. <laughs> we know exactly what that is. So there's a set of contexts in which critical behavior happens, phase transitions and things like that, conformal field theories, and we know exactly what it is and what it does. Is it relevant to all sorts of very broad, uh, complex systems? You know, maybe, maybe not. Depends on the system, probably. But there are, you know, in a, in a you could have a 24 video series just on critical phenomena, and you would go into the fact that one of the nice things about this kind of behavior is that it does appear to be universal. You know, I talked about the Ising model, but there are plenty of other systems for which we have studied the phase transitions, and we find this critical behavior. We find power law behavior in the correlations or the size of domains or whatever you want to talk about. So the idea that at a critical threshold, at a critical temperature, at the phase transition point, you get scale-free behavior. There's correlations on long scales and also on short scales that doesn't seem to depend on the details of the microscopic physics. Again, reminiscent of the renormalization group strategy. So there's a whole bunch of things you could talk about there, but we're trying to talk about big macroscopic complex systems. So let's get there. So that's why power law behavior is also often um, related to what we call criticality. Uh, but let's just talk about the idea of power law behavior more generally. So power laws, what's so great about them? Well, one great thing is that they are scale free. So not only is there no special scale, but there's no scale at all. Okay, this is, this is a, just a mathematical fact about a power law here. There's no peak in this power law distribution, if you look at it, but more carefully, mathematically. So if we plot, well, we should have been careful here. Um, sorry, I'm trying to be careful. So this is the log of this, and this is the log of size. I'm always gonna make log log plots. So just so you know, when you go out into the real world, um, in this game, every plot is a log log plot to a very good approximation. So people stop telling you that they're doing a log log plot versus a linear plot, and therefore, you can get confused. So I'm going to try to keep telling you, but I sometimes I suppress it also. So this is log of, you know, some number of things going on. And this is log of some quantity that they depend on, uh, the size, right, S. And let's say that we have a power law. So our power law is N of S is K times S to the minus alpha, okay? Uh, so the immediate thing we see is there is no S0. You know, when we said, when we had a Gaussian distribution, there was a mean, right? There was a place you go in the middle, and that was x0, x0. This, there is no s0 in this formula. This is just a, you know, this is a power law distribution. There's no mean for it. Um, there's no special place to be, no special size, no favorite size. And also mathematically, there's no mean. You could actually, you know, there's no uh, central point to this distribution. One way of seeing this is that uh, if we let, if we change variables, so let's let s be, uh, let's substitute in some number lambda, just some fixed parameter lambda, times a new variable s bar. So s is the variable, like the size of the elephant or whatever, or the size of the domain in the Ising model. s bar is just the same variable in different units, right? So we've changed from kilograms to pounds or something like that, okay? Well then, what happens to n of s? n of s bar is now k times lambda s bar to the minus alpha, but that's just k times lambda to the minus alpha times s bar to the minus alpha. And I can just define that to be k bar s bar to the minus alpha, where k bar I just made up and it is k times lambda to the minus alpha. So the point is, I start with this form in these units, or this variable, and I end up with this form, 
but they're the same forms, even though I change the size of my units. That's what it means to be scale-free. It doesn't matter what scale we use, what uh, size we use. It doesn't matter if we look if we're using kilometers or megaparsecs or whatever, we will still have this exact functional form for the behavior of the, of the distribution with the same exponent. It's still to the minus alpha power. That didn't change, okay. And there's another feature about these power laws uh, namely, that there are black swans. <laughs> Nicholas Taleb has made this uh, very famous. Uh, what that means is, so here is number, log number. And remember, you know, I'm, I'm plotting these, but the logarithm of a number less than one is a negative number, right? So this plot actually goes negative if you want. It doesn't stop. And this is log of whatever we're looking at, s. So if this is our power law behavior that we know about, what would, on this log-log plot, what would a normal distribution look like? What would the Gaussian distribution look like? It doesn't look like a bell curve. It looks like a bell curve of an ordinary linear plot. On the log-log plot, it looks kind of like an upside-down parabola. So this is the normal, and this is the power law. And we see they're obviously very different. The normal distribution has a favorite size. And here, this is what's called the heavy tail. So what that means is the probability of getting a very large thing, whether it's a domain in the Ising model or whatever, uh, we'll give you other examples in just a second, but the probability of getting something at large s is enormously higher for a power law distribution than it is for a normal distribution. And that's because, because all these are logarithms, a small deviation in this direction leads to a huge difference in size. You exponentiate the difference. And given this upside down parabola sort of shape, um, the deviation for large s is really, really, really big. So it's called a heavy tail because if your probability distribution is power law rather than normal, it is much more likely, given what you're used to, to be surprised by a ginormously large event. Okay, so if you train your probability intuition on Gaussians and power laws, which is a very sensible thing to do because they appear all over the place, you can be very, very surprised by power law distributions. So there are claims that things like earthquakes and solar flares and stock market crashes obey power law distributions. I'm not going to promise you that's true, uh, but there's evidence for it and then people debate it. And what that means is if you say, you know, oh, well, you know, we get an earthquake. Let's, let's take a solar flare. It's my favorite example because it might even be true. Um, we get a solar flare that is powerful enough. Sorry, let's we get medium-sized solar flares every so often, right? And you say, well, okay, I measure how often we get medium-sized solar flares, enough to sort of disrupt some satellite communications, but it's sort of medium-sized. And given how frequently we get them, I don't know, every year, every 10 years or whatever, the probability of getting a ginormous solar flare that would just wipe out all electronics on Earth, that seems to be very small because the medium-sized ones are semi-frequent, but then by Gaussian statistics, you'd expect the huge ones to be very rare. But if the solar flares obey power law statistics, these black swans, these, these very, very apparently unusual events, are actually much, much more likely than you, can, than you might think. And the reason why this is a difficult, controversial thing is, you know, typically you don't know ahead of time what the distribution is, like, you know, God didn't tell you, it's not written in some sacred text, you have to actually do science to figure it out. And what that means is you have data, okay, and then you try to figure out from the data what the underlying theory is. So let's say your data is this. There's your data, and you go, oh my goodness, I have a power law, look at that, it's clearly not a normal distribution anyway. Well, sure, you have a power law, but are you going to say then, therefore, I predict that very large s, it's still a power law? Do I predict that it stays on the curve way out there? I mean, there are other distributions that might go down like that, right? So extrapolating beyond what you already know to things you don't know becomes very, very difficult in this game. So all these are just cautionary words that are very important if you're, you know, playing the stock market or deciding whether or not to spend money, hardening our electrical grid, okay? These are real world problems for complex systems. That's why complex system research is kind of important. All right, now having said all that, let's give you some more examples. So power law distributions are very common. They're not 
when I say I'm going to write everywhere, what I mean is not that literally everything is a power law distribution, but there are many, many things you can find all over the place that are power law distributions. I think the first famous one is the Pareto distribution. Uh, what's his name? Villafredo Pareto was an Italian economist. Okay, so this actually, um, I think this is the first one, but you know, the history of this is a mess. So by all means, look it up and tell me that I'm wrong and I will fix it um, in the Q&A video. So Pareto was an economist and he studied the distribution of wealth. He said, you know, how many people have a certain amount of wealth versus other amounts of wealth. Now, you can imagine a world where, I don't know, the average wealth, let's imagine a happy world where the average wealth was uh, half a million dollars. The average American was worth a half a million dollars. That's not the world we live in, sadly. Um, and furthermore, imagine that what that meant is if the average American had half a million, almost everyone was worth between 250000 and $750,000, right? Whew, that is not the world we live in. <laughs> Even if there is an average wealth for Americans, um, there's a lot more people with below that amount than there are is above that amount because the distribution of wealth. So here is uh, you know the wealth W, and here is the log. Sorry, log of the wealth, log of the number of people who have that amount of wealth, and it's a power. I think it's approximately, uh, so this alpha is like 1.1 in what Pareto did, something like that. Uh, this is something like minus one. And what that means is there are a lot of poor people and a small number of people that have an enormous amount of wealth. And in fact, the way that Pareto put this was that 80%, this is his 80-20 law, 80% of people, sorry, 80% of wealth is owned. Ah by 20% of the people. Now, we're not being normative here. We're not judging whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, this is a power law. That's, that's just an empirical fact about the world. What are you gonna do about it? Yeah, that, you know, that's up to you. Also, by the way, the actual value of alpha matters. Um, if it were a much stronger slope, then there'd be much fewer very, very wealthy people. So one way of measuring inequality is to say, even if it is a power law, what is the slope of that power law? And again, Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. Okay, that we're not gonna talk about. And this is circa 1900 when he said this. So that's a power law. Um, another famous one is Zipf's law. Zipf's law is about the frequency of words appearing in sentences in a language, okay? Or sentences or books or whatever. So here is, we, of course, if you have different words, it's not, um, uh, there's not a number attached to the word. So we're gonna, the, we're gonna attach a number to the word by just ranking them, saying like, there's the most common word, second most common word, third most common word, and, and give them number one, two, three, etc. So here is the rank, and here's the frequency of that word appearing in books in the English language, and it's once again, uh, alpha is something like one in this case. The number of the frequency of the most popular words compared to the least popular words goes as the rank to the minus one power. What that means is the most common words appear very, very frequently. The least common words appear infrequently. So um, if this is the word the, it appears a lot. If this is the word uh, criticality, <laughs> it appears very, very infrequently. Put it in quotes. Use mentioned distinction is being uh, kept up here, okay? So in fact, run the numbers, about 135 words represent about 50% of the English language. So if you take typical word books off your shelves, right, randomly selected, uh, rank order all the appearances of the words, then you get this sort of very small number of words are doing all the heavy lifting, heavy tail distribution, right, power law. Um, there's a lot of interesting things to say about this, just in the in the language game. For one thing, it's true in English, but it's it also seems to be true in Esperanto, which is a totally made up language. Okay, so it's not just that English is weird. I mean, other languages have the same behavior, um, even when you artificially make it up. The same behavior sort of naturally happens. And one thing that is you you probably are thinking of if you carefully watched the entropy video, is that this is a very low entropy dis distribution 
in Claude Shannon's sense of information theory, right? Shannon said um, he was interested in sending signals using words or symbols or something like that over a wire. And he said what you want to be most efficient is an equal probability for all the different words, because then you learn something every time you get a different word. Whereas uh, in the real English language, there's words that are sort of very common and appear over and over again. That's why you can have predictive text algorithms. And it's true that predictive text doesn't always think that the is going to be the next word. It uses the word you just typed, but it's still the same kind of thing. There are words that are much, much more likely than others to appear. So the structure that exists in things like a language is another example of a power law, structure at all scales, something complex going on. Um, there are more examples. Uh, population of cities is an obvious one. cities, um, website links. So this, this turned out, so I'm going to say this one in particular because it, uh, let me say what it is. Given the web, the internet, right? You can ask, well, given a certain web page, a certain URL, this is, this is especially true back in the days, you know, before all the URLs started becoming dynamical and, and keep cookies and things like that. But back in the day we had URLs and we knew where you went we knew what the URL was for every page you were on. And, um, you could count, you could say, well, how many links are there into that website? And there were a bunch of links to Yahoo. This is before Google was even on the on the scene, right? There are a bunch of links to Yahoo, and Ask Jeeves and, and places like that. Um, Amazon was pretty early, right? Um, and there were other, there are many, many web pages where no one linked to them or one other page linked to them. There's a small number where there are many, many links to them. So it's clearly complex structure approximately power law behavior. And this was noticed at roughly the same time when people started to really become interested in these problems at a quantitative level. So understanding the frequency of different links, the number of different links to different websites uh, is a classic problem in this sort of power law complexity game that people play. Okay, so now, it, so if this is true, like we, we gave you a reason why Gaussians or normal distributions are common, the central limit theorem. Why are these power law distributions also common, but in different contexts? Why? What is going on? So it's clearly not the same mechanism that goes into the central limit theorem. Well, uh, that's complicated. This is hard. And now we're, you know, we're going to get it's fighting words and different choices of examples to use. People like different examples. People like to emphasize different aspects of this. But again, I'm trying to give you a flavor of what's going on here. So. Um, it seems, and the reason why it's a hard question is because when we went back up here to um, the Ising model, you know, this idea of a critical temperature, at low temperature everything is one domain, at high temperature it's random, if there's some fixed temperature in between where you're exactly critical, that seems very like delicate, right? It seems finely tuned. It seems like you have to work to get to that critical point and stay there. You could like pass over it, ice will melt, that's okay. But being at the critical point seems like it requires effort. And nevertheless, this critical behavior, a power law type behavior seems to be all over the place. That's evocative, it's, it's, it, it demands an explanation. Why are there all these power laws all over the place in nature? I mean, so, Population of cities obeys a power law, okay? So there are many, many small cities, very few huge cities. The world would be a very different place if every city had roughly 100,000 people, right? Like if some cities had 80,000, some had 120,000, but there were no 2 million or 20 million person cities and there were no 1,000 person cities, right? That'd be a very different world. What's going on that makes our world have this complex structure in it? And the answer is, part of the answer, is that in the central limit theorem, when we took many, many random numbers and added them together and made a new distribution, that choice of many, many random numbers was independent. Like what one random number was didn't affect the next one, right? So the very simple thing and obviously true thing to say is that in these real world examples where people have money or cities have population or words appear over and over again, they are not independent of each other. They are related to each other. So if you think about populations of cities, if you ask yourself, you know, where do I want to move? 
big cities, you know, there are people who like big cities, there are people who like small towns, but there are fewer small, there are fewer big cities. And so if you are a person who likes big cities, you're going to go to one of those, even though there are fewer of them. So the rich get richer. And that's why Pareto is unsurprisingly the first sort of example of a power law. Rich people get richer because you can use your money to make money. Uh, so this is called preferential attachment. Oops. The idea being that uh, whether or not you grow over time depends on how big you are already. I like I always think of the example. There's an Eddie Murphy movie coming to America, where uh, he's he's an African prince, and you know they're talking about where to go. They're going to go to America, and they're like, "There's so many choices. America is so huge. We could go to either New York or Los Angeles." <laughs> You know, there's 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 certain attachments that people have to different places, and so preferential attachment is one of the mechanisms that is put forward to potentially explain power laws. Remember, given any power law, given any distribution of anything, if you if you read the literature on this stuff, number one, people will be arguing over whether there's really a power law or not, and number two, are going to be arguing over what is the mechanism to explain it. That is universal. So don't take any of these suggestions as set in stone. Um, so here's a model that we'll look at. Uh, the model, let's say there are cities, uh, and cities n, there's not n cities, but there's city n equals one, n equals two, different labels on the cities, with population x sub n, just because we like using x as our variable, and p is gonna be used for something else. So we say that with probability p, this is our model, you, a new person randomly chooses a city to move to. So we give the small cities a fighting chance, like there's some chance that you move to any city whatsoever. Even you could move to the big ones in this case also, but it's not dependent on the existing size of the city, so you treat the cities equally. But then with probability one minus p, you move to cities uh, with probability weighted by xn. So let's say you move to city n. In other words, um, there's some probability you just choose randomly, but there's also some probability you say, I'm more likely to go to New York than to Des Moines than to Yardley, Pennsylvania, or something like that, okay? Um, so that's preferential attachment. There's a, it's still probabilistic. You're not telling, saying exactly what's going to happen, but you let people say well, they're more likely to go to a big urban city, okay? And there's various reasons for that to be true. Um, in fact, let's say that... Yeah, did I get this right? Okay, good. And so this turns out, go through the math, do the calculations, you get a power law. Um, you get a power law for the sizes of cities with n of x, the number of cities with population x, proportional to x to the minus alpha, where alpha, if I got this correct, is 2 minus p over 1 minus p. Remember, p is this probability that we choose randomly versus choosing preferentially. Don't, don't trust the details here. This is not something that I personally did. This is just I looked up in a paper. Um, but the point is, you get a power law by this mechanism of preferential attachment, okay? So that's the kind of game, again, that you play in complex systems is you notice something in the data. You plot the number of cities versus their population. You notice it kind of looks like a power law, and you say, huh, can I invent a theory? Can I invent a model that explains that? Here's a model that purports to explain it. Even if this model fits the data, even if you get exactly the right power law, um, it doesn't mean the model's right. It just means it's not wrong. You, have, you haven't falsified it yet, right? But maybe there are other models that get exactly the same explanation for the behavior. This is why the, the field is difficult, okay? Um, so this, but this is one, you know, preferential attachment is one mechanism that leads to power laws. There's a, there are other mechanisms. So let me mention one called self-organized criticality. And one can argue, because one does, whether or not this is really the same mechanism as preferential attachment, just with different words, but it certainly comes from a different uh, point of view. So this is more, you know, this sort of mechanism, preferential attachment, is kind of 
statistic-y, uh, you know, computer science-y, whereas the self-organized criticality is more physics-y. So it goes back to this phase transition idea, you know, the Ising model as the scale-free behavior, but only at the critical temperature, right? Uh, and if you're just externally changing the temperature of something in an oven or a refrigerator, you'd really have to work to tune things to be exactly the critical temperature. And yet in nature, we see things that have this power law, critical behavior all the time. Why is that? So this was an idea of Per Bach and collaborators. I'm sorry, I forget the collaborators' names. Sorry about that. But he, you know, he wrote a paper with other people, but then he kept writing papers on it again and again, became a champion of this idea, so his name is attached to it. Um, and the idea is that you can get critical behavior that maintains itself dynamically. So it's self-organized criticality. It's not that you're changing the temperature knob on something and externally forcing it to be the critical point. If you start away from the critical point, you will get to it in certain kinds of physical systems, okay? That's the idea of self-organized criticality. And the example that he used over and over again was a sand pile. And ironically, it's not at all clear whether this is true for actual sand piles, <laughs> but uh, again, Controversy abounds, it's a complex system. So what you imagine is you know, a pile of grains of sand, okay? And there's some, you know, you, it's, it can't be a square. You imagine there's a real pile of sand so that you drop extra sand grains onto it. And if the slope becomes too large, then you get an avalanche, okay? Then there's a whole bunch of sand that falls down. So you're dribbling sand onto a sand pile and it's building up, building up, and then there's a little slippage and there's an avalanche and it builds up and there's slippage and there's an avalanche. And the question you ask is, how big are the avalanches, okay? So you plot size of avalanche, sorry, log size of avalanche versus the number of them, and it's a power law. Uh, am I getting that right? Yeah, I think so. Let me make my parentheses consistent, otherwise I think I got it right. Um, I don't even know what the power law is. I think it depends on the details of your model of the sand pile or whatever. But this is, but you know, there's no attachment story being told here. Uh, it's sort of a dynamics of the system story. And it's interesting because it is an intrinsically out of equilibrium system. You know, one of the things, um, I don't have time to go into it, but one of the questions, ask me this and I'll go into it in Q&A. Um, one of the questions about complex systems is, how are they, do they relate to entropy, right? If the only thing that ever happens in the world is that entropy increases, then why in the world do you get complex systems? Like entropy just makes things more disorderly, right? But this is an example of something which needs to be out of equilibrium. Like equilibrium would be the sand is just all everywhere on the floor, right? <laughs> it's equally distributed. Here is something that has an external influence. You're dropping sand into more or less the same location, or maybe even drop it right onto the top. But there's some randomness in where it falls, okay? And then that leads dynamically to this sort of critical behavior. Um, complex behavior, if you want. It's not the most complex thing in the world, but is this, a, this power law-like behavior. So it's an example, it's like a little hint of how the fact that you're not a closed system means that rather than, you know, in a closed system, if you just have a box of gas and you start it, you know, all the gas is in a quarter or there's two different kinds of gas and they're all separate from each other, it will naturally mix and go to a high entropy state, to an equilibrium state, and it will stay there. That's the universal behavior. This is not a closed system. We keep dropping things onto it. And so the claim is that there's a different place it goes. It goes somewhere. It goes to this critical behavior, you know, the number of avalanches, um, but it doesn't go to the equilibrium configuration. It goes to this critical point and it stays there naturally. And I think that it's safe to say that it is not fully understood the conditions under which this happens or why it happens or the more robust theory of this. Uh, there's certainly a lot of papers written and maybe I'm even wrong about that. Maybe it is completely understood by somebody else, but uh, I'm just mentioning it as an example of a way to get critical-like behavior. And I think it's interesting that it, it, it intrinsically involves this external influence, but not a tuned external influence, not an external influence that is trying to make things like look like a power law. It's kind of a random external influence that puts it into this power law kind of state. Okay, um, good. Now, uh, I would lose my license as a, as a good scientist if I left you with the impression that power laws were everything. And I think that, you know, Per Bach, uh, who passed away, I believe, um, 
he sort of got a reputation for claiming the power laws were everything. And this is why there was some pushback just rhetorically, like scientists are human beings too, and they have their favorite ideas and they push them sometimes. Um, but power laws are not everything. And so there is in particular um, other ways to get approximately scale-free behavior in very similar, via set, very similar mechanisms to what we've looked at here, okay? So consider, here's an alternative to power law. And the alternative is, it starts, you know, we, we gave the preferential attachment model where you have sizes of cities and there's some probability that you'll move preferentially to a big city. But what about, that's sort of an additive thing. You keep adding more people. So what about multiplicative models? I'm not sure what the technical term here is, but uh, I'm calling it a multiplicative model. So imagine that, uh, let's say for, for example, for uh, size of an organism. So what we imagine here is that uh, at each time step, the size of an organism changes, and it changes in the following way, that the size goes to some number times what the size was, where this number is a random number chosen from distribution, random variable. And we imagine the random variable is maybe like it has a Gaussian distribution or something like that, um, or some other kind. There's dis distributions that, it, that you could have, um, but the point is that it is you know centered near one, maybe. I guess the thing could expand. It doesn't need to be centered near one. But the point is it is independent of S. So you multiply the size of an organism. So maybe it grows a little bit, maybe it shrinks a little bit, okay? It's a random number, so it could potentially do either one. And it does that over and over again. But the point is that it expands by a constant factor, not by a constant additive amount. So it's not like you pick a number of kilograms that could be positive or negative, and you add it to the size. You take what the size already was, and you expand it proportionally or decrease it proportionally, okay? That's the trick of this multiplicative model. And then what you get, so you get a number, distribu number density distribution as a function of size, and you might have guessed it'll be power law or something like that, because this is kind of similar to the preferential attachment idea, but it's not. It is a log normal distribution. And that's kind of an intimidating name. So this is um, something called the multiplicative central limit theorem. Central limit theorem, okay? So the central limit theorem says then we kept adding random numbers together and we got a Gaussian distribution. So when you multiply, remember I already told you that when you take the logarithm of the product of two numbers, you get the sum of the logarithms of the two numbers. So logs and exponentials are related by changing multiplying into adding and vice versa. So if instead of adding, you're multiplying, that's kind of like adding the logarithms, right? Multiplying two numbers is adding logarithms and then exponentiating the answer. So what the log normal distribution is, is let's write it down and I'll try to explain it. N of S is proportional to one over S. That's an extra factor that you get in there times, it looks like a normal distribution. Remember the normal distribution was e to the minus X minus X naught squared over the standard deviation. So this is gonna be e to the minus log of X minus, let's say, L naught squared over two sigma squared. So it's a normal distribution for the logarithm of X, not a normal distribution for X. That turns out to make a huge difference, okay? If you plot this, um, and this is not a log-log plot, so here's N of S versus S, it's kind of gonna look like this. So it kind of looks like a bell curve Gaussian thing near the peak. There is a peak, right? There is a center. Here's something where you can actually calculate the mean. It's not right at the peak, but it's, it's close. But then there's also this long tail, right? That is kind of power law like. So a power law like, you know, X to the minus one or S to the minus one might look like this, right? So, oops. This is the power law and law, where this is the log normal, 
And for large values, they look very, very similar, okay? They are different things, different origins, slightly different uh, shapes, but at large values of S asymptotically, they begin to resemble each other at least a little bit, okay? So watch this. I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to pull in. I made a plot for you. Look at how much I care about you folks. Um, no. Let's see. No. Yeah. Photo library. Good. Check it out. Okay, so I made a little plot in Mathematica where I plotted on a log-log plot. This is log versus log n, okay? So you see that on this plot, on a log-log plot, the power law in blue is a perfectly straight line. The log normal in red looks pretty straight. In fact, if you sort of had uh, cut it off, so if I just stop the plot there, then just between here to here, it looks very, very, very similar. So if what you're doing, if the game you were playing was um, you start with data and your data points, let's make them bigger than that, okay? Let's make some big old data points. There's a data point, there's a data point, there's a data point, there's a data point, because real world data points have scatter in them, right? So you tell me whether those green lines are best fit by the red line or the blue line, okay? So if you're careful, um, one of the things that you need to worry about in this game is, okay, you have structure on many different scales, but is it really a power law or is it a log normal? And the reason why that makes a huge difference, it's not just a matter of best fitting the data, okay? I mean, that's good. Fitting the data well is good. But you recall from everything we've just said, the underlying models that give rise to this behavior are completely different in the two cases. So if you want to make an argument why your distribution looks a certain way, it matters to you enormously whether or not the data are best fit by a log normal or a power law, okay? Furthermore, look out here, <laughs> way out here, they begin to deviate at very, very large uh, values of the independent variable. So again, if what you care about are the tails, the really, really unlikely black swan events, the difference between having a log normal and a power law matters a lot. So this is why, you know, the actual real world uh, applications of these sort of scale free behavior, or at least approximately like this, there is a scale here, unlike the real power laws. This is absolutely a scale here. There is a central value and a standard deviation, um, but they look very similar empirically. And so doing this in the real world is hard. That's why, you know, scientists are paid the big bucks. That's okay. All right, I wanted to, um, end up just by sort of, I, I told you some of the basic underlying ideas behind uh, these complex behavior, scale-free behavior, power laws, low normals, and all that stuff. Let me just give a little application to biology because this is kind of um, cool, individual organisms. So we have the idea that this field is called allometric scaling. The, the question is, um, how do things change as organisms get bigger or smaller? In a very general sense. So bigger might mean you know, taller or more massive. And the things you might measure are uh, its metabolic rate, its lifespan, its heart rate, its fastest speed of running, whatever it wants to be. Um, various different things that you can measure as a function of its size. The field of allometric scaling is how do features of an organism change as a function of its size? And this goes back you know how far back this goes? I think Galileo was one of the first people to talk about this. There's a basic feature that you don't need to involve complex systems or anything like that to understand, which is just that space is three-dimensional, okay? And what that means is that different features of an organism depend differently on its size before you get to actually what their dependence is. So there's something that is called the square cube law. And roughly speaking, this is just the statement that becomes important in different contexts, but the statement is that in three dimensions, okay, if I have something of linear size L, the area of its boundary, whatever it is, in, in two dimension, in three spatial dimensions, so this is a sphere, okay, the area is proportional to L squared, the volume is proportional to L cubed. 
That's why it's called the square cube law, because some things depend on the area, some things depend on the volume, and those things change differently as the linear size gets bigger. So uh, the famous thing that you might have heard of is J.B.S. Haldane wrote a famous um, piece called On Being the Right Size, right, where he points out that for organisms, this makes a big difference. What this means is that, you know, there, there are various things, like I said, um, what depends on area? Things like um, cooling. If you imagine that you're an organism, you have a metabolism, you're generating heat inside, you need to expel the heat, right? And you expel the heat, roughly speaking, through your skin, right? Through your epidermis or whatever. Different organisms will do different things, but that's a common thing to do. Well, the amount of heat you generate is proportional to your volume, but the amount of heat you can expel is proportional to the area of your skin. So as organisms get bigger, it becomes harder and harder for them to cool off, right? This is a basic fact. Um, another one is uh, leg strength. If you think about, you know, the, the, the uh, volume contained in your leg goes as the length cubed, the size cubed. But what matters is sort of the cross-sectional area of your leg. That will, that will tell you how strong your leg actually is. So the strength of your legs goes as L squared, but the mass that you're holding up goes as L cubed. And what that means is for small things, so you know, spiders, right, for example. Spiders have skinny little legs, big bodies, and one, two, three spiders, not insects, right? Eight legs well, are enough to hold up the spider. Tiny little legs, also true for insects. Uh, tiny little legs can hold up a relatively large body, whereas for elephants, the amount you need to hold up is scaling as L cubed, if L is the linear size, and therefore they need these big squat fat legs. And they only have four of them. I mean, how is it even possible to get along? Which is why, by the way, King Kong cannot exist. Sorry. I already told you in an earlier video that Ant-Man can't exist because you can't make atoms smaller. Uh, King Kong can't exist also because if you just scale up the size of a gorilla, it would have to change its shape in order just to walk around, uh, in order not to collapse under its own weight, okay? Um, I'm not even gonna draw, okay, here's an elephant. There we go. Um, this explains, so the, the point of this, the reason why this is interesting is because you might think if you were so purely a biologist that you didn't know anything about physics at all, and there aren't any biologists actually like that, but let's imagine a straw biologist. Um, you might imagine that things like the shape of different animals was set by evolution and DNA, right? Like there's some DNA sequence, and in principle I could have any shape I want, and you just imagine, you know, which one survive, right? This is saying that you can understand features of living organisms without talking about evolution. There are features of living organisms that are simply true in response to the laws of physics, to the basic way that things scale with size, okay? Um, Maybe there are more things like that. That's an interesting current area of research. And this line of reasoning goes all the way. Like if you get big enough, everything becomes a sphere. There's a reason why planets, stars, are spheres. Black holes are roughly spherical, right? Because the gravitational pull is more important than anything else at some point. If you had a much more massive, if you had, let's, let's say you have a neutron star, okay? It's much smaller than Earth, but much more massive. Uh, the size of ripples on the surface of a neutron star are proportionally much, much smaller than the size of mountain ranges on Earth. Things become more and more spherical as they become more massive for exactly this kind of reason. One of the reasons why Pluto, uh, sort of only ambiguously a planet, is because it's not clear that it's big enough that it needs to be a sphere. <laughs> Hydrostatic equilibrium is the technical term here, but one of the points of definition of what a planet was, according to the International Astronomical Union, is that it needs to be spherical. It needs to be in hydrostatic equilibrium. Okay, that was a that was a uh, uh, digression, but this basic idea of scaling uh, according to different powers, depending on what property you're looking at, was recognized in biology for a long time. These days, it's become a lot more sophisticated. So now, there are measures of metabolism, for example. And what turns out to be the case is that if you study the metabolic rate of 
various different kinds of animals, but you know something in the same um, classification. So you know, just like when we were plotting the mass of the elephant, it was important we distinguish between you know African elephants and Asian Af African elephants and Asian elephants because they would have different distributions. Likewise, you should be comparing mammals to mammals here or insects to insects, but otherwise you can uh, compare many different things. It turns out this scales as the mass to the one quarter power. So the 0 0.25 power to a very good, like this is an empirical fact. Um, in fact, this is called Kleiber's law, I believe. And it's been known for a long time, 1930s, something like that. Um, I mean, that's interesting for a couple reasons. It's a power law, right? Rate proportional to mass to some power. Um, it is a weird power law, like the one fourth power. Why is it that? Like, you know, minus one, plus one, you know, these are things we understand, like why one fourth? I mean, empirically, if you just get it from data, you don't know it's exactly one fourth. You fit the best thing. It's, you've noticed that it's, you know, 0 0.24, 0 0.26, something close to a quarter. And you wonder, is there something going on that can explain that? And then you notice, you know, also, you can say things like heart rate closely related to metabolic rate, but not exactly the same, um, proportional to mass to the minus one quarter. So metabolic rate is a total amount of energy that you use. Remember, the cooling is something that uh, you need to scale as your, as your body's area. Uh, so you can't have the metabolic rate, the amount of energy being used up in your body, simply be proportional to your volume and therefore to your mass. Otherwise, you'd overheat. For large animals. So the metabolic rate is, the total metabolic rate, the total rate at which energy is consumed inside your body, is higher for large animals, but not that much higher. Otherwise, they would overheat and die. The heart rate actually is lower for large animals. The heart rate in an elephant or a blue whale is much smaller than the heart rate for tiny little animals, for a shrew or something like that, okay? And let's see, if I remember this, I think that I even got another plot for you. Photo library, yes, here we go. Check it out. So here is the um, metabolic rate of different animals as a function of their body mass. Um, and so you can see all the way down from small birds and mice, much less than one kilogram, all the way up to elephants and bulls and horse. It's a pretty good fit. This is a log log plot, right? You can tell 0 0.01, 0 0.11, 10, 100, 0 one, one, ten, hundred. So a log, log, plot, straight line. And the slope turns out to be a quarter. Okay. Um, data, you know, don't, don't tell anyone I never showed you data here. Why? Why is it not only a power law, but look, it's the same power, just with a minus sign. Clearly, clearly this is not an accident, right? Can't be an accident. Well, we're not sure, but there's a very good theory um, from Jeffrey West. Jeffrey West was a guest on the Mindscape podcast, one of the very first guests. So I encourage you to go check out that podcast and he also wrote a book called scale where he talks exactly about this in wonderful detail and applies it to cities um let me tell you something about cities don't let me forget to tell you something about cities in a second but you know cities societies the internet as well as biological organisms so west brown and enquist in 1997 so very recently okay this is not ancient news here. They proposed a model, and this is what we do. We see the data, we say, hmm, why is it like that? We propose a model, and we ask if it fits the data, and then we ask if we can test it in other ways. So they said, consider a network. So remember um, preferential attachment model, right? Um, you can think of that in network terms. You can think of every city as a node and every little line that comes out of it. I mean, this is sort of more inspired by websites, I guess. But um, yeah, let, let's, just, let's just stick with websites. It's a better, it's a better model. Uh, websites are a network, clearly. There are websites and they link to each other. So the websites themselves are nodes. The edges of the graph in the network are the links between the websites. And they're ordered. You know, I can link to you even if you don't link to me. But anyway, it's a network. And you can talk about the degree of, that, of the node, like how many links are coming in or coming out. Uh, so networks are a very common way of conceptualizing these complex systems. So, so consider a network, these, these people said, that has the following properties. Uh, one, it's space filling. So this is not something like uh, the website, but this is something like where you have a region of space, three-dimensional space, and you have a network, which means you have some 
nodes and they branch off to other nodes and something like that. And there's some discretization or whatever, and maybe there's more, but in some sense, you fill up all the space. So maybe like all these nodes take up a certain volume, but there's no space left unfilled. That's an assumption. These are assumptions and we're gonna derive a conclusion from our assumptions. Um, it is optimal efficiency. So whatever it's doing, converting ATP into energy, pulling muscles, running around, whatever it's doing it, it's doing it at, at, the, at the most efficient rate that it can do that. So given the fuel it uses, it puts it to use in a very good way. Um, and three, it, the ends are constant size. So the, the in-between in ones, I, I'm not sure about this. I guess the in-between ones need not be the same size, but all the ending ones, the terminal points of the network, where there's no nothing else coming out, only things going in, all of these have the same size, okay? That is part of their assumptions. And from these assumptions, they derive, they make a theorem that various properties are proportional to, and then, you know, the number of them, you know, the number, yeah, I'm not going to, get the notation right, but the properties are proportional to the mass, which is proportional to the volume, to n over 4, where n is a number that depends on um, whatever property you're looking at, okay? So n4 equals the dimensionality of space plus 1. So in other words, this sorry, this didn't quite make sense because it's too much detail to actually you know prove this. I'm just stating the result and, and explaining why it's interesting. It's interesting because they propose a set of axioms, a set of postulates that seem superficially reasonable for this might be your nervous system or your circulatory system or your respiratory system. All of these are networks in your body. Okay, so they have uh, you know your brain and it sort of branches out into all your nerves and everything, and it fills space. So it fills your body everywhere in your body. You have these nerves, and they end. And the brain is bigger than the individual nerves, but all the nerve endings they assume are equal sized, and they derive from that the fact that all the different properties you might want to measure of this network will scale as the size of the organism to some quarter power. I mean, mass here is just a you know a proxy for density or, or, or a proxy for uh, volume because the density of different organisms is approximately the same. And the reason why is because of a property of the network in three spatial dimensions, okay? If we were two-dimensional organisms, then instead of these quarter power laws, we would get one third power laws. And if space were four dimensional, we'd get one fifth power laws, etc. And that's true. It works. You know, they, they got the right number. They explain the four that appears in these different phenomenological empirical power laws. Is it right? Is, it, is this the explanation for why these scaling laws go this way? That I'm not so sure about. But uh, I think it's plausible. I think it's very, very plausible. And this is the kind of thing that we're studying. This is the kind of thing why complex systems research is useful. Um, this reminds me of the other plot I wanted to show you, and this is just for fun, but this is another one of Jeffrey West's favorite plots. This is uh, how fast people walk <laughs> as a function of how big the city is. Um, here is the size of a city on the horizontal axis. Vertical axis is walking speed. This is another uh, power law. You can actually show that it's a power law. People walk faster in big cities. Why? It's hard to tell, but again, you could imagine coming up with a model like, okay, there's more people there, and uh, you know, there's, you could, this is the problem. So I'm not gonna tell you the answer because I don't know what the answer is. Since I'm not gonna tell you the answer, you'll have to think of the answer yourself, and you will soon realize the problem that you can think of more than one plausible answer. Why do people walk faster in big cities? Well, maybe big cities uh, attract go-getters that really wanna go everywhere fast. Maybe people in big cities are more likely to work in jobs that have deadlines they need to rush around. Maybe when people are surrounded by other people, they want to sort of get out of it very quickly, and so they go faster. Maybe there's more stimulation from the news media or from the environment around them. So you can, you can come up with all these different models, right? And then you try to figure out which one is right, and it's not easy. Okay. The final thing I will say, I'm not even going to write any equations or even sentences. I'll just say the brain. 
by which I mean you can study either the physical network wiring of the brain, what is called the connectome. You know, we have something like 85 billion neurons in our brains and they're wired together in a very specific way. Uh, we don't know the wiring diagram for the brain yet. That is one of these big science projects that is ongoing right now. Um, but it seems like it is, it is likely to be some sort of scale-free complex network. Even without knowing that, you can actually look at activity in the brain. So forgetting about the individual wiring between the neurons, look at you know, which, si which sites in the brain light up while you're awake, while you're asleep, things like that, and how they uh, fluctuate, right? And it's basically like the Ising model, where you're sort of looking at domains, like are there bunches of neurons lighting up? Or is there just one neuron lighting up? How many neurons are lighting up? Um, there's a claim in the literature that if you look at the sizes of different regions in the brain lighting up, it obeys a power law. Um, so it is critical behavior. And there's even a, an explanation for that. And the explanation is, look, if just the whole brain lit up, that you're not really doing a lot of thinking, right? Like that's just like moving in lockstep. It's like the low temperature Ising model, all the spins are aligned. But if it was just random fluctuations, that wouldn't be good either. That wouldn't be careful thought. Um, uh, Jennifer Willette, my wife, wrote a book called Me, Myself, and Why, where she studies, you know, the brain and, and the self and how we come into existence. And she investigated this question and talked to the experts. And one of the experts, Dante Schialbo, gave her this wonderful quote that says, look, you know, this brain where everything is random uh, or this brain where everything is moving in lockstep, this is the brain of an idiot. <laughs> this is not the brain of someone who's doing uh, optimally efficient information processing. So it's the idea that somehow complex structure is needed to be conscious, to sort of be complicated enough that we describe people as conscious creatures. And evidence for that is that the scale-free behavior that is uh, purportedly seen in the brain, in brain activity, goes away when you're asleep. When you stop being conscious, um, there's still low-level localized fluctuations, but they do not connect over large distances. So somehow the, this manifestation of complexity in behaviors at all scales seems to be important in the brain. I'm being very wishy-washy about exactly what's going on here because we don't know. There are papers in the literature arguing back and forth whether activity in the brain is truly critical or not quite critical, power law, log normal, other distributions, things like that. So all of which is to say is, I hope I've given you a flavor for this field of study. It's not exactly my field of study. I'm learning more about it, and it's just fascinating to me. Uh, it's different in character from the other stuff we've done in the Big uh, Ideas videos, but it's important because, you know, uh, the world is compli complicated. The world is complex, and we would like to understand why. It has something to do with entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. It also has something to do with... Um, uh, collective behavior, right? Small pieces coming together to do big things. And the fact that it's pre-paradigmatic, and we don't yet know like the, what the perfect spherical cow here is, um, is not a bug. It's a feature. It's, it's part of what makes it exciting. Like it's, it's harder in a field like this to get a killer result that everyone agrees is really, really important. But the chances of getting such a result are kind of higher. Uh, because they're still out there. The low-hanging fruit is still to be picked. There's so much we don't understand about complex systems. I think it's one of the very fun, very interesting, very promising places to look for in science in the decades to come.